Marijuana. Weed. Uh, pot. Kush. Herb. Grass. I don't know. Ganja. The devil's lettuce. Cannabis or THC. Mary Jane. Loud. I know there's some CBD things now that... I don't know what it stands for, but... That's all I can think of. <laughs> Blunt. Bongs. That's not, that's not weed. Whatever name you give it, cannabis is the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States. And it has a pretty prevalent place in our society, popping up in our media and on the news. Marijuana has long been considered a gateway drug. Gateway drug. Gateway drug. Marijuana is a dangerous gateway drug. Leading to the use of other more addictive and more dangerous substances. But what does marijuana actually do to the human brain? and body. And is it as dangerous as D.A.R.E. always led us to believe? This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Well, marijuana has been legalized in several states, and it's legal for medical use in several others, so it's becoming more mainstream. In fact, it's legal right here in California. So we went to a local cannabis dispensary to talk to some experts in the field. So my name is Shelby. I am the assistant marketing director here at Tori Holistics. Here at Tori Holistics, we really try to do a lot of education uh, because that's ultimately where we are going to break down the stigma, where people are going to realize the medicinal benefits of cannabis. Tori Holistics um, opened as a medical dispensary in 2015. We were the first in the state to get our recreational retail license, but we still uh, serve medical and recreational alike. <laughs> Marijuana use in the U.S. has a pretty interesting history. Early white colonists brought cannabis to North America to cultivate as hemp, which was used for making rope, clothing, and paper products. During the 1800s, it became popular as a medicinal treatment, and hashish houses flourished. Until 1906, when the Food and Drug Act required labels on anything containing cannabis. Then, as Mexican immigrants began arriving in the U.S. following the Mexican Civil War, they brought recreational marijuana with them. Racist anti-immigration sentiment rapidly led to fear of the marijuana menace. In the 1930s, a string of very dubious studies linked marijuana use to violence and crime, and states began to outlaw the narcotic. When Henry Anslinger, the chief of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, was appointed, they were going through a budget cut because of the Great Depression. So to keep his title and keep funding for the department, they actually kind of created this whole uh, scare around cannabis. He started referring to it as marijuana because he knew that everybody was already consuming cannabis. It was in tinctures you could buy it at a local pharmacy. And so the senators who were voting on this uh, prohibition bill didn't realize that marijuana was the same thing as cannabis. So they effectively voted to ban the very uh, substance that they were using for their own medical needs. Following the release of the famous film Reefer Madness in 1936, the federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act, effectively outlawing cannabis except in specific medical and industrial cases. For decades, despite new and better research indicating that marijuana isn't associated with violent crime and debauchery, marijuana use was increasingly restricted, and the punishments for its possession and use became more and more harsh. And Slinger first pushed it as like, you know, like you're gonna be really lustful and you're gonna do crazy things, it's a gateway drug. And then he actually changed his rhetoric um, later in the century to be like uh, cannabis as a lazy stonery drug, like you don't get anything done, you're uh, not contributing to society at all. This eventually led to all kinds of government policies like mandatory minimum sentences, a three strikes policy, and President George Bush's war on drugs. These have had lasting and damaging effects on many US citizens and the public's perception of marijuana. You can learn more about the history of these laws and their effects on our country's citizens by checking out the links in the description below. But then, in 1996, that started to change. Medical marijuana was legalized in the state of California. And now, almost 20 years later, cannabis has a pretty prevalent place in our society. Public perceptions and acceptance of cannabis has definitely improved in the last several years, especially in light of the opioid epidemic. Uh, people are much more receptive to a lot of the research and the findings coming out. So 
it might seem kind of weird that we actually don't know very much about the risks or benefits of marijuana. See, even though it's becoming legal in more and more states for a recreational and medical use, Cannabis is still outlawed by the federal government, so it's heavily regulated and restricted. That means that it's difficult for scientists and doctors to get marijuana to actually use in their research. And without that research, it can be hard to say much about the possible dangers or benefits of using the drug. So what do we know? When you smoke a joint and get that high feeling, What's happening in your brain? Even that's not so simple. Cannabis has two major chemical components, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and cannabidiol, or CBD, plus smaller amounts of a whole bunch of other cannabinoid compounds. These molecules act on what's called the endocannabinoid system in the brain by binding to cannabinoid 1 and 2 receptors. These receptors were actually named after cannabis because they were identified by scientists trying to understand how the drug works. Both kinds of receptors are found throughout the body, but CB1 receptors are the most common in the brain, found at the end terminals of neurons. The brain produces endocannabinoid compounds which bind to and activate CB1 receptors. Cannabinoid receptors are G-protein coupled receptors, so when they're activated, it kicks off a cascade inside the cell that has some effect downstream. In this case, that means modulating the signaling at the synapse. The molecular biology of this is actually really, really complicated, but in general, activating CB1 receptors has an inhibitory effect on the release of a variety of neurotransmitters, including dopamine, GABA, glutamate, noradrenaline, serotonin, and acetylcholine. Our best understanding of the endocannabinoid system is that it plays an important role in regulating other systems in the brain and throughout the body. In the brain, endocannabinoid signaling plays a role in memory, cognition, pain perception, and motor movements. THC is considered a psychoactive compound, meaning that it affects perception, cognition, or behavior. It binds to CB1 receptors, activating the endocannabinoid system, and inducing the feelings of relaxation and euphoria that are commonly associated with cannabis use, as well as impairments in spatial and verbal memory. Your license, where's your license? It's on the bumper, man, back there, man. No, I mean your driver's license. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I got my driver's license, man. Users of cannabis often report enhanced introspection and sometimes feelings of anxiety or paranoia. Cannabis use can also lead to the munchies, feeling like you're hungry, thought to be a result of the way that THC is processed by the liver. CBD, on the other hand, is not a psychoactive compound. It has the exact same chemical formula as THC, but with a slightly different chemical structure. This means that it binds to the endocannabinoid system differently and doesn't induce those psychoactive effects. But it's being explored for treating a variety of conditions and is believed to be anti-inflammatory, like ibuprofen. Most notably, it's used to help prevent seizures in very severe types of epilepsy, and it's being explored for use in treating migraines and anxiety. Speaking anecdotally, I have friends who swear by CBD for treating their migraines. So uh, CBD has become more popular in research um, and it's showing that it's very powerful uh, analgesic, very um, powerful anti-inflammatory agent, and you don't need to experience any psychoactivity with it. So now you can consume cannabis without that uh, psychoactivity that some people are kind of put off by. You can have the medicinal benefits uh, alone. One thing I always like to say everywhere is that if you ever find yourself too high, say you take an, took an edible that you're just feeling really overwhelmed with, have some CBD on hand. CBD will bring you down from that high. The products that are available for medical and recreational use contain different varieties of cannabis that have different effects. Some have higher levels of THC or CBD, and different strains are reported to have different psychoactive effects. Like how people say that indica is relaxing while sativa is stimulating. The difference between different strains uh, like indica and sativa involves something called the entourage effect, which we uh, use very affectionately in this industry. Um, it has to do with 
the over 113 different cannabinoids and terpenes in uh, the cannabis plant. They play on each other in very unique ways. If you think about how many different sorts of combinations those uh, cannabinoids have, all of these different regulatory compounds are um, working with each other to create a specific effect. How long the sensation lasts depends mostly on how the cannabis is consumed. If it's smoked, it usually takes under three hours for the sensations to fade, but oral or edible doses can last much longer, with some of the effects lasting up to 24 hours. The research on the therapeutic benefits of cannabis use are so far pretty optimistic, though the studies are still plagued by small group sizes and restrictions on marijuana use. The long-term effects and risks of cannabis use also depend on how it's used. Some risks are obvious, like if you smoke cannabis, you're at an increased risk of problems like chronic cough, bronchitis, a weakened immune system, and lung cancer. Unlike a number of other drugs, like alcohol or opioids, Cannabis is not physically addictive. That means that if you stop smoking weed cold turkey, you might feel irritable, anxious, and have some trouble sleeping, but it won't make you sick or kill you. It's also thought to be pretty much impossible to fatally overdose on cannabis. Last year, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism stated that uh, 90,000 people died from alcohol-related causes, whereas with cannabis, there's never been a reported incident of an overdose. So yes, it's much safer in that sense. Consuming a very large amount can lead to extremely unpleasant consequences, like psychotic episodes, but it won't directly cause death. But that doesn't mean that using marijuana doesn't come with other kinds of risks, or that using marijuana can't have negative effects on other aspects of your life like any kind of drug or addiction. Using marijuana during pregnancy is believed to carry risks like a low birth weight and possibly other developmental problems, though it's difficult to say if these effects are definitely a result of marijuana use or other external factors. If a person starts using marijuana as a teenager, before their brain has finished growing and developing, it can have long-term effects on cognition and memory. Researchers have done small studies using MRI scans to look at brain structure in adults in their 20s, with people who are diagnosed with a cannabis use disorder, basically meaning that they use a lot of weed and it has negative effects on their lives, and people who don't use cannabis at all, and found that teenagers who smoke pot daily had abnormally shaped hippocampi and did worse on long-term memory tasks compared to non-users. Some research has found that heavy cannabis use starting during adolescence can have long-term effects on dopamine signaling in the brain. Dopamine is a chemical that plays important roles in reward and motivation, as well as movement control. Scientists think that this is likely due to heavy marijuana use interrupting normal brain development, resulting in problems with the wiring and leading to problems down the line. And in general, people who use a lot of weed have issues with verbal memory and cognitive tasks. Pretty much all of this research has been done in people who use a lot of cannabis, like, every single day for extended periods of time. So far, we don't know much about the possible risks of just occasional usage, like in social settings or on the odd weekend. Our view of cannabis use at Tory Holistics is that moderation is key with anything. You drink too much coffee, you're gonna get a stomach ache. Um, if you use too much cannabis, you could have a memory impairment, um, but it all comes down to just consuming responsibly. In places where marijuana is legal, it's generally pretty easy to access. There are storefront dispensaries where you can talk to bud tenders and shop for your favorite varieties, or online sites that allow you to order products for delivery to your front door. But even where it's legal, there are some restrictions. It's highly taxed, for one thing, and you must be over 21 to purchase it recreationally or over 18 to get a medical marijuana card. Cannabis, in California at least, is more regulated than the food we're eating. If it's grown on a farm, maybe a mile down the street from another farm that uses pesticides, the labs will pick up on that and it won't be able to be sold. So the cannabis you're consuming, as long as it's from a legal licensed dispensary, is very, very safe. And while some surveys indicate that more than half of all Americans have tried cannabis at some point in their lives, around 163 million people, 
only 4 million people would classify as having a cannabis use disorder, a rate of about 3%. In contrast, about 5-6% to of Americans who try alcohol during their lifetime will become addicted. This could be because it's just generally much easier to access alcohol than it is to get weed, and we might see those numbers changing if marijuana continues to become more mainstream in the US. And remember how marijuana is considered a gateway drug? While it's true that marijuana users are more likely to abuse alcohol and nicotine than non-users, the majority of people who use marijuana will never go on to use harder substances like opioids. And even when marijuana users do use harder drugs, it's at the same rate as people who use other already legal drugs like alcohol and nicotine. So it's not an effect of cannabis so much as it's an effect of any drug that affects the reward systems of the brain. There is a misconception that cannabis is a gateway drug and they're finding now that it's actually an exit drug. It can be very helpful actually in uh, people struggling with addictions. I see the cannabis industry fulfilling the need for alternative forms of pain management. With the opioid epidemic, I think that a lot of people are seeking alternative forms of relief and they're finding that with cannabis. Ultimately, we know that cannabis is a very complicated plant with complex chemical components, and we don't fully understand its effects on the human brain or the long-term risks or benefits of its use. Scientists are hard at work on studying this topic, trying to better understand the chemistry and neuroscience of cannabis as it continues to be legalized in more states and becomes more popular nationwide. I am so excited about the research coming out. Like I was saying, there's so much to be done. Um, over 113 different cannabinoids that we've only just touched on. So um, I think that the findings are just gonna continue to show the medicinal qualities of cannabis. Because it's still federally outlawed, there are a lot of complicating factors in its use and study. Like it might be legal to use cannabis in your state, but you could still lose your job if your employer has a zero tolerance policy. One issue that I think about a lot is the fact that we don't really have the marijuana equivalent of a breathalyzer to quickly determine if someone is currently under the influence of cannabis or not. That means that unless a police officer actually sees a person using weed, it's really difficult to know if someone is committing a DUI because a person might test positive for cannabis even many hours or days after its use. At any rate, it seems likely that marijuana is at least as okay as any other currently legal substance available to the public. That whole reefer madness thing was just propaganda. We must work untiringly so that our children are obliged to learn the truth, because it is only through knowledge that we can safely protect them. So if you live in a place where marijuana has been legalized, enjoy responsibly. Do you have strong feelings about marijuana legalization or its use? What concerns do you have as it becomes more prevalent in our society? Or what benefits do you think it might offer? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions and a huge thank you to Shelby and Dr. Beth at Tori Holistics for their help with this video. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. Over and out.